My dad and I live in an airport. That's because we don't have a home, and the airport is better than the streets. In the opening lines of Eve Bunting's Fly Away Home, we learn about a little boy named Andrew and his dad. They live amongst the crowds in a busy pre-9-11 airport. Andrew's mother has passed away, and his dad works as a janitor in the city. They save up for the day when they can finally leave the airport and have their own home again. I first heard this story as an eight-year-old when my teacher read it to our class. It was the first time I realized I wasn't alone. When we think of homelessness, typically we think of people sleeping and begging in the street. But many homeless people are hidden. Some are out of sight in night shelters and hostels, yet the majority of homeless people are hidden because they sleep in their cars stay on friends' sofas, and still continue with their daily routines as if their living situations were stable. Flyaway Home gives us an example of a family we don't see in society. I didn't live in an airport, but just like that little boy, I experienced hidden homelessness. I was raised by my single mom and my older brother, Jim. What happened to us happens to millions of people every day, the income cliff. My mom worked, but the rent and daycare bills exceeded what she made. Her salary was not enough for us to live on, but according to the US government, her salary was too high to qualify for assistance. The income cliff is also known as the low wage trap. Every year, struggling moms and dads keep low paying jobs in order to continue receiving government benefits because they know taking a higher paying job will not provide enough to cover their bills. My mother knew there was no upward mobility from a lower paying job if you never take a higher paying one. Taking this step from poverty into the lower middle class is difficult, painful, and requires persistence. My family lived in poorly built apartments in the suburbs of Maryland. We ate a lot of peanut butter and jelly sandwiches because they weren't costly. My mom drove a 1988 Mercury Tracer. We weren't buying expensive things. We simply could not afford to live. When the rent went up, we had two options, move or be evicted. This is how we became homeless. In a world where social media allows us to see what people are wearing, when people are eating, and where people are traveling, there are still parts of other people's lives we don't see. There are three things in particular I'd like to talk about today. We don't see what official figures can't show us. We don't see people's personal histories, and we don't see how we can engage with hidden homelessness. The first thing we don't see is what official figures can't show us. In February 2017, The Independent ran an article by Gaia Marcus entitled, To Combat Homelessness, We Need to Count the Hidden Homeless Too. Marcus lamented the invisibility of homeless people unrecognized by authorities. It all, it all comes, comes down, down to who is counted as being homeless, she wrote. <coughs> as a result, we have two groups, the counted or the hidden and uncounted homeless. Okay. Now, the numbers we have on the counted homeless have limitations. Some figures reflect the number of homeless on a given night, while others reflect the span of a year. Some figures reflect the number of households, while others reflect the number of people. When I searched for homelessness in the UK, the primary articles listed only gave me the numbers on England. I had to do separate searches for Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. Within the counted homeless, they're divided into two groups, in priority need and intentionally homeless. Sadly, hidden homelessness is not a fully acknowledged category. In fact, there isn't even an agreed upon definition of homelessness, of hidden homelessness, excuse me. <clears throat> so before I get to the next slides, which we've already seen a preview of, I, I wanna make it clear that I am in no way comparing the data between the US and the UK. The data is collected differently. Uh, because my family experienced homelessness in the US, it's important to understand these numbers. So in 2016, 94,465 households in the UK were counted as homeless according to the government's statutory homelessness reports. In 2017, 553,742 people were counted as homeless 
according to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. But these official figures do not include people finding temporary solutions to their housing problems by sleeping with family members and friends, staying in their houses, by sleeping in hostels and B&Bs, squatting and sleeping rough. Though it wasn't the first time my family was homeless, the time I remember most clearly was the beginning of primary two, or first grade in the US. I woke up, dressed in my uniform, and went to school. What my classmates and teacher didn't see was that only the week before, my mother, brother, and I had slept in the hallway of my mother's office. My brother carefully placed cushions from office chairs onto the floor to give me a makeshift bed. We slept away from the windows and doors where no one could see us if they passed by. At this point, you might be thinking, Rachel, why didn't your mom reach out to a charity and find help? My mom had a full-time job at a commercial real estate firm. With a full-time job and a car, most charities did not consider our need great enough. We were turned away on more than one occasion. So who is counted as being homeless? In the US, cities and states count the number of people applying for housing. Charities that run night shelters and transitional housing count the number of people they help. But firsthand counts also occur. Men and women volunteer to count the homeless living on the street. Some of them even dress inconspicuously so they can walk amongst the homeless undetected. They do this because in the US, um, in order to qualify for federal funding, local government has to conduct a count at least every other year for services for the, hidden, for, for the homeless. So federal funding won't come to those cities unless they do these counts. Unfortunately, counters miss, they miss people because they can't see everyone. Hundreds in cities are missed. According to the National Alliance to End Homelessness, it's estimated that at least 4,610,000 are living in hidden homelessness in the US. That number is far greater than the 554,000 that are counted homeless. Okay, here in the UK, local government counts the number of people applying for housing. Charities and night shelters count the number of people they help. Crisis, a charity doing phenomenal work to end homelessness estimates that there are roughly 66,000 hidden homeless households in the UK. And that's in addition to the 94,500 counted homeless households. So here we see the difference between the counted and the hidden. And in the UK, the difference between the counted and the hidden. Great. The hidden, uncounted homeless need to be recognized. They don't show up in official figures, but as I've shown today, it is possible to recognize the hidden homeless next to official figures. The second thing we don't see is people's personal histories. These photos are from Independence Day, July of 1990. I was three at the time and my brother was 10. These look like regular old family photos, uh, swimming, handstands, playing in the pool. But we were homeless when my mother took these pictures. We had just lost our apartment and placed all of our belongings into storage, so we were staying in a budget motel. From the outside, people may look fine, but the reality people are living is much more complex. There's a common misconception that people who are homeless are homeless for the same reason. It's assumed that everyone who's homeless has a problem with addiction. While that is true of some, there are many reasons for homelessness, including loss of a job, escape from abuse, a death in the family, and an overall loss of resources. Loss of resources does not just include money. It also includes childcare, proper care for mental and physical disabilities, and affordable housing. July of 1990 was the first time we slept in our car. I was stretched across the back seat with a pillow and blanket. The seatbelt buckles dug into my back, so my mom tucked the blanket around the buckles to make me more comfortable. My brother Jim lay in the passenger seat, his knees tucked toward his chin so his feet were off the floor. And my mother reclined in the driver's seat. The heat of July was unbearable. I can remember my mom cautiously turning the manual cranks to crack the windows slightly so we could get a little bit of a breeze. At night, we parked at rest areas along the I-95 toll road, which had 24-hour access to restrooms. 
Dozens of drivers pulled over to shut their eyes for a bit or get fast food. With our clothes and toiletries in the back of the car, we blended in well as we slept. When I think about that summer, I remember how displaced I felt all the time. This is not the type of anecdote you share at a cocktail party, as you can imagine. It's also not a topic that comes up in conversation, or at least regular conversation. Um, what does come up in conversation is when people start to talk about places they've lived and everyone else's list is short and your list is long. I'm married to a proud army brat who moved houses many times. When the subject of moving comes up, he gives his answers confidently. Until last year, I was the opposite. I glossed over how many moves I'd been through. I said things like, I grew up around Washington, D.C., but I never said the words, I moved 13 times by the time I was 13 years old. According to the Homelessness Monitor, an exhaustive ongoing study here in the UK, one in 10 adults in the UK has been homeless at some point in their lives. And according to the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, 14% of the American population has been homeless at some point in their lives. Which brings us to the last thing that we don't see. We don't see how we can engage with hidden homelessness. One of the unique challenges my brother and I had was that we went to private schools on scholarships and we were constantly surrounded by wealth. In a place where seemingly everyone had money, we were two kids who went in and out of homelessness and we were dressed in uniforms just like everyone else. I realized something about the experience of growing up in hidden homelessness. Everyone assumes you've always had a home. We live in a place where it appears everyone has more than enough, but the data says our peers have struggled. There are people among us who've experienced hidden homelessness. Recently, someone came up to me and said, Rachel, I know exactly what you're talking about. I slept in my car when I had nowhere else to go. And I had to hold it together and not cry because that's exactly how I responded the day my teacher read Fly Away Home. How can we help people who are hidden? We can engage with hidden homelessness by getting curious. We need to ask questions important, uncomfortable questions, and then we need to listen to the answers. If we can create a culture of honesty about hidden homelessness, I believe we'll start to bring it out of its strange and shameful obscurity. If we can allow people to be open about the experience of hidden homelessness, we'll start to see real data that can help people who are hurting. There's another way we can engage with this issue. We can think about its definition. I mentioned earlier that there is no agreed upon definition of hidden homelessness. Without a proper explanation of this issue, it's difficult to discuss and to eradicate, so I wrote one. Hidden homelessness is the state of living in need of permanent shelter, finding temporary shelter out with the recognized housing of local and national government and charities. If you leave here today knowing what hidden homelessness is, you're much more likely to care about it in the future. There are several people who took the time to care about my family's struggles. My Aunt Margaret has been at every major event in my life. She even came to Grandparents' Day when I didn't have a grandparent who could show up. My Aunt Annie and Uncle Bill watched us during the summer once we got older so my mom didn't have to pay for childcare. My church youth leader, Susie, invited me over to her house to watch her children, but she ended up mentoring me and giving me outlets to test my creative abilities. But the primary reason I'm standing here today is because my mother went without haircuts. She never bought herself new clothes. She even went without meals in order to feed us first. She put Jim and I into good schools. She didn't graduate from university, but both of her children have. My brother started bussing tables at 14 years old in order to help pay the bills. He received a full scholarship to university playing Division I tennis. They taught me that hard work is a part of life, but they did something else. They gave me the luxury to imagine, to think of a world where when people are hurting, they're seen. In looking past what official figures can't show us, in truly seeing people and considering their personal histories, and in understanding how we can engage with hidden homelessness, it is my hope that hidden homelessness will have been a part of my past so it doesn't become a part of someone else's future. Thank you.